pay to go. We're on the air. Thank you. Well, welcome, bienvenidos. I am so uh, full of warmth and energy and poetry excitement to welcome you today to our final Cultivating Voices live poetry new book showcase for 2021. It is hard to believe that it has been another year of, of sh sharing amazing poetry with our live audience, which we've been doing every Sunday since March, 2020, where we've brought you poetry weekly from around the world as part of our international, intergenerational, intersectional Facebook poetry group and reading series. And I want to take a moment to offer my immense gratitude to all of the readers who have joined us just this during this past year in our new books showcase. And of course, to all of you who have attended here on Facebook, some of you watching from there and those who sign up to join us as part of our live Zoom audience every Sunday, and of course today is it's our new books showcase. Well, I'm Sandy Yunon. I'm your host as I am most Sundays for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. And today we will be hearing from the newest collections and poetry and other poetry from our four poets, Sudeep Sen, Kathleen Flanagan, Pamela Hobart Carter, and Marsha Karp. I'll introduce each one of them individually and a reminder to all of our fabulous audience members, the chats are live here in Zoom and in Facebook. So please do send your support and encouragement along during the readings. And you'll also be seeing links to their collections as well. And if you are able, I'm sure you will want to be picking up some poetry collections. It's not too late in this season of gift giving and poetry is one of the best gifts we can share with each other. So please do be generous and support the poets and their presses by purchasing a book today. And as I said, the links, thank you to Kim Ports Parsons for providing the links for today's poets. And let's get started. Well, first today, I'm so happy to welcome back Sudeep Sen, who helped anchor earlier this year our poet's focus on Anthropocene earlier this year. And uh, it was ironic because we did the poet's focus reading on the theme before the new book showcase of from your collection. <laughs> but at that point, we didn't have, you know, we only had a, we only had availability late in the year by at that point. And uh, so it is fantastic to have been following the journey of your new book that came out earlier this year and to be able now to welcome you for the new book showcase, Sudeep. I'm, I'm so grateful mm -hmm. having you joining us this evening. Let me give you a little more of the biographical information about our first 
accomplished and wonderful reader and member of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Sudeep Sen's latest collection, as I mentioned, is Anthropocene, Climate Change, Contagion, Consolation from Pippa Ran. Sudeep's other prize winning books include Postmarked India, New and Selected Poems from Harper Collins, Rain Aria, which won the AK Ramajan Translation Award, Fractals, New and Selected Poems, Translations from 1980 to 2015 from London Magazine Editions, Arrow Text from Vintage Penguin Random House, and Zen's newest work also appears in New Writing 15 from Granta, Language for a New Century from Norton, Indian Love Poems from Knopf Random House, and so many other locations. Sudeep is the editorial director of ARC Arts, editor of Atlas, and currently the inaugural artist in residence at the Museo Camera. And uh, you also often see uh, him hosting his very uh, popular international poetry program as well, which I hope you'll folks will want to uh, know of your series, your two series that you do. Sudeep is the first Asian American, the first Asian honored to deliver the Derek Walcott lecture and read at the Nobel Laureate Festival. And as I said, Sudeep, I'm, 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 I'm so grateful that we get to hear again from Anthropocene. Would you please welcome Sudeep Sen? Thank you, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, as it turns out, uh, Sandy, um, when we did the program then, uh, the Indian edition of the book had just come out. And this is timely because the UK American edition has just come out a few days back. So effectively, again, it's a new book for a different part of the world. I've put up the, thank you. I've put up the link if anybody wants to uh, get hold of a copy. Um, so it's lovely to be back on your program. I actually quietly watch you guys. Many of the faces are very, very familiar, sitting quietly uh, in New Delhi, which is where I live. Um, and uh, it's wonderful to see familiar faces. So it's, it's, it's just a warm space. And thank you, Sandy and Dawn, for creating this beautiful, beautiful thing. The first poem I read from, um, Anthropocene, which sort of, which looks like this. It's called Disembodied. And this is set in Delhi, my city. And um, of course, you'll see the resonances in terms of issues and content everywhere else in the world. So it's fairly universal, even though it's very much located in my city. Disembodied. My body carved from abandoned bricks of a ruined temple, from minaret shards of an old mosque, from slate remnants of a medieval church apse, from soil tilled by my ancestors. My bones don't fit together correctly as they should. The searing ultraviolet light from Aurora Borealis patches and etch corrects my orientation. Magnetic pulses prove potent. My flesh sculpted from the fruits of the tropics, blood from coconut water, skin colored by brown bark of Indian teak. My lungs fueled by Delhi's insidious toxic air, echo asthmatic sounds, a new vinyl dub remix. Our universe where radiation germinates from human follies, where contamination persists from mistrust, where pleasures of sex are merely a sport 
where everything is ambition, everything is desire, everything is nothing, nothing and everything. White light everywhere, but no one can recognize its hue. No one knows that there is color in it, all possible colors. Body worship, not for its blessings, but its contour. Artificial shape, shaped by Nautilus. Skin moistened by L'Oreal and not by the season's first rains. Skeleton strength, not shaped by earthquakes or slow molded by fearless forest fires. Ice caps are rapidly melting, too fast to arrest glacial slide. In the near future, there will be no water left or too much water that is undrinkable, excess water that will drown us all. Disembodied floats afloat like Noah's Ark. No GPS, no pole star navigation, no fossil fuel to burn away just maps with empty grids and names of places that might exist. Already, there's too much traffic on the road. Unpeopled hollow metal shells without brakes swerve about, directionless, looking for an elusive compass. The next poem is a poem which uh, will resonate with people who live in the United States. Um, it's called Obituary, and this was written just after the first um, wave broke. Um, it has two photographs. I don't know whether you can see them clearly. One is the front page of the New York Times, which was just one blackened out page. And there was another front page later on, which was just the names of people who had died in the first uh, wave. Not all the names, of course, could fit there, ironically. So these two graphic images, of course, were you know just way too startling for any sensitive person not to react to. But also around the same time, uh, <clears throat> the George Floyd thing was going on. Nothing has changed, of course, dramatically, sadly. Um, but uh, this is just a poem, both in response to the visual image as well as what's going on around the world and there. Uh, the epigraph I use in this is simply the headline of the second uh, newspaper, which had the list of uh, people who had died. Obituary, and I quote, they were not simply names on a list. They were us. Death knell peels, numbers multiply, virus ravages us one by one. Newspaper columns loom on steady ghostly apparitions on broadsheets, name, age, date of death. Tall epitaphs in fine print. Ink spills, bleeds dark. Newsprint blotting out a wheezing breath. No amount of hygiene ritual enables our lungs to resuscitate. Our lives, micro point size fawns on an ever inflating pandemic list. Black specks, fugitive lonely numbers, the deceased on an official roster, another sick, another dying, another dead. Yes, they were us. And the next one is a sort of companion. Thank you very much. Um, the next one is a, a, a sort of companion poem to the one I just read. This one's called Hope light leaks. Uh, this book is um, 
split into three parts. The first part is climate change, is something that I've been engaged with for a long, long time before climate change got trendy. Now, of course, there's all the all sorts of people writing on eco poetry and so on, but you know, it's something that has affected us long before we uh, have come to this. The second part is, of course, the pandemic, which is, I think, a subset of the larger climate change issue. And the last part uh, is called consolation, because I think hope and light are extremely important in the ingredients for us to sort of live on. Without hope or without light, there's just no way we can carry on. And this one's called Hope Light Leaks. And um, uh, again, uh, um, side B of my life is as a photographer. So uh, this was at night, I'd gone to the loo, I shut, then I came out, I shut the door behind uh, me and forgot to turn off the lights. And there was just a little crack uh, on the top and the side where the light was leaking through. And oddly, it looked like a kind of an unformed crucifix. So this was this wonderful image, which you can't but not respond to. But of course, it's also homage to um, Black Lives Matter and so on. Brown Lives Matter too. <laughs> All lives matter, actually, I just hope. That is the message. Uh, it opens with an epigraph from Martin Luther King Jr. And I quote, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Late at night, light leaks, spilling beyond the door's rectangle edge. Leaving schism, it's new resurrection. Light load expands, contracts. Photons spill, conduction sparks. Light slow removes, cataracts veil. In this blackness, lives matter. This book is a multi-genre book. It also has a section of photography in it. Um, uh, when the lockdown happened, it was very severe, as you know, in India, you know, there was just, I've lost 12 people I know personally to COVID and the pandemic. Um, so it's, and this is just me. I mean, the people who sort of, but I want to sort of partly lighten the tone because it's not all doom and gloom. I just, just good to see smiling faces on the screen, even though it's a sort of mosaic of tiny rectangular tiles I look at. Um, this poem is called Language. And of course, language, without language, we can't exist. The language is the core of um, uh, what we do. Um, it's uh, also misused, as you know so well. In, in America, of course, fake news, uh, election was fought, won, lost, fought, people died all over the world. So last space, it also is misused very badly. But this one is just a poem about just the joy of language. And it's an ode to my old typewriter, which when I was in high school, which I had bought with my um, uh, savings, um, a secondhand typewriter, still have it, still works, but the real difficulty is to find the silk ribbon, the red and black ribbon to source. Those are very difficult, I think. Um, this poem opens with an epigraph from Italo Calvino, and I quote, without translation, I would be limited to the borders of my own country the translator is my most important ally. My typewriter is multilingual, its keys mysteriously calibrating my bipolar forked tongue. Black red silk ribbon spools, unwinds as the carriage moves from right to left. 
In cursive hand, I write from left to right. My tongue was born promiscuous, speaking in many languages. My heart spoke another, my head yet another. The translation seamless. Oracles, ventricles pump blood. Capacel-like alphabets, phrases, syntax, cross-fertilize my text, breathing life. Texture enriched, music, cadence, spatially enhanced, osmotic, polyglottal, a polygamy of grammar. Letter forms, dance, ligatures, pirouette, ascenders, descenders, pitch perfect. Imagination isn't caged in speech. Speech cannot be caged in language. Thank you, very kind, very generous. Um, I'll read a very short poem which begins the, uh, begins the volume. Um, and it's simply called, that is I dot E dot. And I sent the rough draft to my son and of course, young boys tend to be completely dismissive of what the fathers or mothers send them. <laughs> Deep, you might want to start again. You're cutting out just a little bit. No. One more poem. <laughs> But he did, um, and I said, you know, that's good enough. You know? But I said, you know, sorry. Oh, I was saying you're cutting out just, you're cutting out a little bit. So uh, oh. we didn't hear. So, so, so make sure we get to hear the whole poem, please. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. I, yeah, you're fine now, but you would just cut out. Oh, yeah, okay. 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 See, okay. See, I, see, I, it was fine this, this end, but yeah. Okay. Sudeep, I've I've also I've turned off your video because I think that'll help with the high quality audio. Okay, no problem. That is. That is because you hear the sound of a lone rustling leaf. You hear the sea. That is because I consider the sea silent. You hear its silence in my studio. That is, and because of that, the silence will not empty the sea of its leaves. Thank you. Um, this is a poem called um, Ceremony, Om Ceremony. Om, as you know, is the first civilizational sound, the sound that comes from the womb, the sound you hear in the cosmos. It's the very, very first sound uh, we hear and very much part of our prayer chants. If you hear the Buddhist chant, Om Mani Padme Ham which uh, loosely translates to, uh, oh, the jewel in the lotus. So that's Om, and uh, it has, um, it references uh, a, a Indian Kashmiri American poet, many of you may know him, Aga Shahid Ali, uh, who died. Uh, he introduced an Indian formal uh, verse structure called Ghazal. Uh, mispronounced in America as gazelle or gazelle, which is <laughs> difficult for us to hear, <laughs> but it's guzzle. 
which is always in couplets and um, uh, it's a strict form. It's a beautiful form. So um, there's a reference to Shahid who is no more. Om a sediment. In my city, I'm surrounded by constant cries of the dying, burning pyres heaving under burden of wood, smoke and bones. Wailing summed up by sonic notes of Om. Civilization's first sound, Sanskrit syllable echoing a conch shell's harmonic mapping, its involute spiral geometry holding within an emanating airborne sonar screams. My ancestors, grandmothers, mother blew into the smooth shell cupped in their palms, held intimately as if it was a talisman a prayer, a pranayam in yoga's daily ritual. But breathing is a privilege these days. Pandemic struck, oxygen deprived, my friends perish, the country buckles airless. Even an exquisite ceremony lacks the sheen or wax to wrap the contours of a corpse now. Each day as I write endless condolence notes, etching dirge-like couplets on gravestones, my city continues to be dug up, not to make space for burial sites, but for palaces of illusion, an architecture of frozen music, greed, calumny. A country without a government, a country without a post office, Shahid laments. Let me cry out in that void, say it as I can. I write on that void. Om, celebration now, a seizing requiem. Yet we chant in hope for peace. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Sudeep. That, that, that litany of Om and all that comes with that privilege of breathing as well as the privilege of getting to hear poetry which of course is part of our breath part of our hope and uh, part of what we hope and continue to hope for as peace and also healing for the earth and for moving through the pandemic. The, 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 the book is Anthropocene. It is, the, it is uh, in such an important book that is, addresses the intersections of climate change as Sudeep mentioned, prior to the pandemic, but also, of course, in the space of um, the specter of the pandemic as well. Thank you for bringing it to us once again, uh, to our consciousness here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I, of course, look forward to the next time and uh, be very, very well. Thank you, thank you. You've been a very, very kind and appreciative audience. Just, just, just good to see all, everybody smiling. That's good enough for me. <laughs> well, we're traveling quite a bit today, my friends, um, with our poets. Uh, we'll come back across the time zones uh, right here to my 
to my home state here in Washington in the Pacific Northwest. And I'm so very, very happy to be able to share the work of a poet that's been so important to us here in Washington state, as well as nationally. And that is the poet Kathleen Flanagan. I had the absolute joy to be able to participate in um, and see Kathleen in the Laureate Love Fest that was local here in Olympia, Washington, which was the inspiration for us for our Laureate Love Fest earlier this week in February. So it is uh, just a tremendous, tremendous joy to be able to bring uh, Kathleen's work to you today uh, in the spirit of how she really influenced my thinking that day as I sat and listened to her work and moved, it, and moved us all forward into 2021. Um, where we were able to also bring back um, poet laureates. Let me tell you a little bit more about Kathleen, and there's a there's a real um, reason for me to have invited her for this particular reading today, particularly with Sudeep. Kathleen Flanagan is the author of three poetry collections, most recently post-romantic from the University of Washington Press, which was a finalist for the Washington State Book Award. A poem from that collection, Married Love, was recently featured in an episode of the podcast, Poetry Unbound. Her second collection, Plume from 2012, is a personal history in poems about the Hanford nuclear site and won the Washington State Book Award and was also a finalist for the Poetry Society of America's William Carlos Williams Award. Her inaugural collection, Famous from 2006, won the Prairie Schooner Book Prize in Poetry and was named a notable book by the National Library Association. As I mentioned, it's a, as a resident of Washington, it is, it is always a, a true gift for me to be able to welcome a poet laureate from our state. And Kathleen served in that capacity as Washington State Poet Laureate from 2012 to 2014. Would you please welcome Kathleen Flemick. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I'm just so pleased to be here and uh, I'm really honored to be reading with our, our poets today. And I'm so glad to be introduced to Sudeep Sen's work. I was very moved by your reading, Sudeep. Um, I'm gonna be reading from my most recent collection, Post Romantic. And uh, it's a mix of poems about marriage and about life, um, memory, and um, sort of, there's certainly environmental issues and, and, and political issues mixed in there. So I hope that some of the poems I've chosen to read today sort of indicate that a little bit. Um, but I also just wanted to read some poems that I hadn't really read very much. And uh, so I thought I would begin with one, um, that's called On This Day in History, um, which is a little column that sometimes appears on the comics page or on the first page of the newspaper, if you read newspapers anymore. Um, anyway, this is called On This Day in History and begins with an epigraph. Charles Lindbergh Jr. was discovered dead beside a road buried in dirt and leaves. I find a small body in a doctor's office magazine and the shadow of an inconsolable nanny waiting for my tea water to boil. 
Once in Tacoma, I stared at a torn yellow window shade four stories above the street and felt on its other side a drifter working the kinks out of a famous kidnapping scheme. It was the light, which is bound up in my theory of time travel, which is tied to the angle and intensity of the sun. The diffuse light emitted in a stand of woods, the smoky light inside a falling down barn. I'm stepping through black and white woods, then plunged into green. Here, after months, under a fallen limb, the last thing I said that I still mean. Compare its grain of truth to the ladder leaning against the Lindbergh window. I've stumbled on my father and his twin in their baby buggy riding shafts of early 20th century sun and my own unformed self in the shade of a 1960s tasseled awning. Time is a poor alibi and there are too many coincidences to explain. The baby's headstone engraved with my birth date, my instinct for escape, this lifelong fascination with flying. I wanted to read, I have a, a poem in here that at least has a Christmassy title and I thought for this season I would share it. It's called Poeing, Poem Ending with Lines from a Charlie Brown Christmas. I enter my childhood home, a newly minted 40 year old orphan desiring everything rifling through the kitchen junk drawer and the auxiliary rubber band drawer and the third drawer full of twist ties and styrofoam meat trays. I want like a robber, the silverware and the encyclopedia set. I want my mother's sense of her own beauty. I want the sound of the house settling at night. I'm the baby of the family. I want my brothers to love me more than I deserve. I'm taking the sugar and creamer engraved with Shakespeare to, thy own, to thine own self be true and actions speak louder than words. I want the prizes at the bottom of every box of cereal ever eaten here. Before we sell the house with its dear ghosts and take our turn growing old, I insist on one last game of risk. And this time I will not cry and will demonstrate strategy. All I want is what I have coming to me. All I want is my fair share. Which is my favorite line from that TV show. <laughs> okay, the, um, this, Secret dedication, which isn't very secret underneath this, is to my husband. Um, my his his company Christmas parties uh, are sort of interesting, um, and for a number of years they were really like thought it was super cool that I was a poet laureate. They didn't know what it meant, but they really made a big deal of it. So every time we would have a Christmas party, they would come to me and say, "Are you going to write a poem about this?" and um, so actually something happened where I actually did write a poem about it. This is called karaoke. Do something, you're his wife, somebody begged me when you're a couple of verses in, but wasn't everybody forced to take a turn? I watch you center stage where you never ever want to be. Stunned in the revolving red lights of Jimi Hendrix. Are you experienced? A song we now know has no melody or end. Laughing is wrong. What else is there? Your boss records the crime on his iPhone. It's suddenly clear how much effort goes into just being, just holding ourselves still, our bizarre niceties and party store lays, the saucy meatball you stabbed then abandoned on a plastic plate. A few with good manners pay no attention and pour over the list of has-been anthems. How did we get this far into a foreign century, this many levels down into middle age? Outside the bar, it's night. 
We've got to find our car in the frigging cold and make conversation all the way home. I won't be able to say I wanted to wrap you in a blanket like the survivor of a five alarm fire. And who cares if you were naked? Um, so the, my second book, Plume, was about the Hanford nuclear site. And that book has had, it's, it's really been taking me on a journey. It sort of had a life of its own. And, and one of the kind of interesting things that have happened is it's taken me to conferences and all kinds of sort of technical um, meetings. Um, and I attended a conference once and, and I, about the uh, Manhattan Project sites. And there was a biologist who gave a talk about the, um, this experiment they performed during the uh, tests at the Bikini Atoll in 1946. Uh, they put these animals on a uh, abandoned uh, ship and then they, they did an above ground test and, about, uh, and below you know, water uh, nuclear test. And, so he was describing how this test all came to be. And I was so kind of bowled over by the story that I had to go home and immediately, I did some research and then I had to write this down. It's called Operation Crossroads. In July, 1946, two atomic blasts were conducted by the US military at Bikini Atoll to study the effect of nuclear weapons on warships. Sailors boarded the floating abandoned ship, a frigate about to become an ark, unloading caged rats and mice, bags of insect laced meal, goats and pigs, which the men dressed in naval uniforms of uncertain rank. They rubbed flash creams into the shoat's whiskery skin, shaved goat's hair in human styles, which encouraged the willies and rude remarks. Many were farm boys, checking rats against a master list, sweat rolling down their bare backs. They secured goats in the galley, mice in the brig, carried in cages or pulled by the neck. The pigs in sick bay roamed among the berths. They got their sea legs, Two sailors pulled a hat on a pig on, a, on deck, but he wouldn't have it, kept wriggling free, sensing their ridicule, or perhaps the despair underneath. The pig they locked in a ship's head squealed the minute the door clicked shut. Sailors tied goats to bunks, to valves in the engine rooms, backing out of each tableau, closing hatches on the bleeding and shitting every animal anxious, picking up on the sailors' cues. Then they debarked, counting human heads three times before pushing off, motored back to the USS Burleson and moped around the empty pens full of straw where the pigs and goats had lived on the high seas for a month. The countdown began. Anybody who bet on the pigs to live lost if not the day of the test, then in a week, or in the second undersea blast, and had to pay up for his optimism. Except Pig 311, locked in the ship's head, who was found later dog paddling with sea turtles toward Bikini Atoll. All right, I have two more poems. Um, and this is a memory of, I think it's one of my, I, I think it's a very, very early memory. I was still in a crib, so that's how early it was. All unknowns were equal. All unknowns were equal when my head was still soft like a mushroom, and I'd wake in the abandoned light to a consciousness like moss. How large that yellow green world with its shadow prints on the window, but also the marshland that was I. Some scale measured the two equal. And since I could wander only a few steps in either direction, I wasn't afraid. 
This seems now like the vestigial memory of some other ancestral being, though I still feel the blue satin quilt pulled to my chin and watch myself unfolding fingers from a hand at the far reach of my arm with the patience I'll never recover or comprehend. The patience of a low place in the land waiting to become a sea or maybe an inlet since the self is rinsed each day in the world. Mother used to say, I'd lie quietly in my crib a long while. And then this, this will be my, my last poem and I'm so grateful to you all for watching and I'm grateful to be here today. And uh, this, is, this is a long marriage love poem called With Seagulls. The wind today contains some errant sea breeze, redolent of the fifth day of our honeymoon when we bought a pail and shovel at a hardware store. I'm pondering the sci-fi novel you described over fish and chips, barely mentioning the characters since love and human frailty are secondary to black hole transport and the problems of colonizing the ring around a moon. Then you segued to the data center at work and my mind defragged for a while. In one of the chambers of your heart, a seagull is always riding a thermal, genius of the physics of the wing. In my family growing up, seagulls were considered rude opportunists with vacant looks and dirty minds. I forget for years at a time how far you and I have traveled. Then a seagull drops down for a French fry and there you are holding so still the transaction between you is personal and delicate like when two married people start liking each other again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Again, friends, the new book is Post Romantic. Let's see that. Do you have, can, I always love to have people show their, yes, indeed. From the University of Washington Press. Uh, I wanna just say anecdotally that when I was when I was a, a kid, I always read that on this day in history, and it like it riveted me for some reason. There was something about vertical time, how things landed from one you know from one the same day all throughout time, and I was fascinated. I was very fascinated by that. And it's interesting how many threads you picked up on because the other thing is um, I collect Peanuts memorabilia as well. <laughs> so to have read a, the, the poem that featured Charlie Brown and then finally, finally, I did a lot of research on Lindbergh too and that ladder that that image of the ladder always going up to the window and there's a very famous photograph of it as well mm -hmm. has just kind of always haunted me about what then became called in 1927 the crime of the century there would be far too many more crimes of course and you bring us right to some of those crimes in talking about Hanford and Thank you very much. I Thank hope you. you'll come back Thank and you. read with us again. It's been a great joy to visit with you and Thank your you. poetry today. Well, our next poet is also here in Washington State today. Uh, 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 a, a really 
a, a, a poet that I've gotten to know personally through our group Poets on the Coast with Kelly Russell Agadin and Susan Rich. And it's always, it's always a real, um, it always fills my heart to bring one of the sisters to the program uh, to celebrate, particularly when it's in celebration of, uh, of your work, of your work. Well, Pamela Hobart Carter is the author of two poetry chapbooks. This is one of my favorite, I love this title so much and I didn't even, I haven't told you this. I love, but here it is, held together with tape and glue. It's like one of my favorite titles ever. From Finishing Line Press 2021 and her imaginary museum from Kelsey Books from 2020. You have been quite busy and doing well, and I'm so pleased. Pamela's plays, in addition to her poetry, her plays have been read or produced in Montreal, where she grew up, Seattle, where she currently lives, and in Fort Worth, where she mentioned she's only visited. Um, and she's earned two degrees in geology from Bryn Mawr College and Indiana University before she became a teacher. During COVID, she's added make a poem at home lessons to her website. And uh, please let's put, I'll put that website in the chat. Um, the very eclectic, creative, always involved in the endeavors of creativity uh, beyond, beyond poetry. And I always love to hear about your playwriting prowess as well. It is just a great uh, delight to have you sharing from your latest collection, Pam. And here we go from Held Together with Tape and glue. Pamela Hobart Carter. Thank you, Sandy. It's kind of scary coming after the prior poets, I gotta say. <laughs> um, I've, I've, um, I'm just in a state of overwhelm, but here it goes. <laughs> um, I will start with held together with tape and glue. And I'm showing the cover also today, not just to show off the cover because I'm, I'm very happy that the book exists, but because I want you to see the photograph that's featured in the collage here. Um, the first poem is based on that photograph, which is by Robert M. L. Raynard, um, who lives in London and who I've only met through social media. Flight over a quiet square. When a bird flies toward you and you raise your lens, you can't be sure the solar angle or the contrast between its white plumage and the shaded verticals of formal colonnades and fancy fenestration behind it will show to the advantage you imagine. You frame strong sun painting feathers bright through the gull's fanned tail and wing edge the flying form at an active banking angle about to alight on pale gray pavers, discreetly delineated foreground. We dream of flight, of riding sky, of letting a wind hold us aloft, landing as easily here as on a rooftop. This next poem um, has some elements of, of the being held together with tape and glue. <laughs> foresee the cloud horse. Don't we find what we foresee? Is it a sort of universal law, particles spelling the message available only as wavelengths of imagination that daily pass so as to return us to a state of wonder? to set our dreams upon, to set our dreams upon like a song now, a cloud horse gallops across a blue meadow. 
Um, I've mentioned to a, a, a few people that <laughs> about how Jericho Brown has described that we can make use of those poems that we may not really endorse for our own selves that we've we may have struggled over and realizing, like, eh, you know, there's nothing else that's going to happen with this one. It's not going to go anywhere, but you can pluck a line or two out <laughs> from here or there and, and paste them together. And that's how some of these poems came to be, which is um, where I got this title from, Sandy. <laughs> how to go at it. With fertile velocity, no fake scraping or bowing a meticulous approach because key moments are both fragile and profound, swift to quash with a stumble. Through the gate to this garden, we find thistles and bird fetch as well as roses. Notice how bees visit all blooms, not only those sown by hands. Inhale this sweetness, this tang. The last poem I'm going to read from Held Together with Tape and Glue is um, Beyond the Human Range. Um, I, I uh, have found it very fascinating to think about how our vision differs from that of, of other creatures and that we don't all see the same wavelengths. Beyond the Human Range. Ospreys perceive a range beyond our human spectrum into ultraviolet, hues incomprehensible, available only as wavelengths of imagination. Are we too big to catch the acute hunter's scope as we, unfurred and indelicious, play hopscotch across sunny sidewalks and empty lots? Our cones do celebrate the swishing tints of blue and tangerine that surround us and supply our inner vision. We paint what we suppose ospreys survey and never miss what we cannot see. I um, brought beside me to the computer a packet of poems I've been working on that are that are actual collages, <laughs> and um, and I I in responding to um, Sudeep and and also to Kathleen I, I just I pulled this one off because um, of the water connections in it. Uh, so this this is this brief collage poem, learning from the drops of water your adventures become a solution, river as form, cascades gift you family. Think about self through confluence. The next poems I'd like to read are from her imaginary museum. And I'd mentioned that um, I kind of grew up in museums because both my parents were art historians and um, whenever we traveled, that's what we did. <laughs> so we'd go to museums. Um, so I became familiar with a lot of, of artworks. Um, and some of these are about real artworks and some of them are about some that I made up. <laughs> and then there are others that are a little off, off topic too. This is shooting at the keeper. Around the edges, in the emptiness, low or in the corner where he can't reach, you find grace, advancement. You know all this, yet you fire at the keeper. The goal lies in the negative space that envelops the saints adoring, the bowls of fruit and the Parisian cafe with sky or table or sheet of gold. You forget you were the protagonist and on the pitch or in a panel, the man in the box framed by posts or by guilt draws focus, keeper as figure, net, ground. Our teacher has it right, insists we see, not laugh at the upside down Goya. 
makes us sketch her slide of the 3rd of May for the chance of all chances, the formulation of a memory, that sinister abstracted scape broken by white arms flung defensively toward the bottom of the screen. Net is figure, keeper, ground. That's also in honor of my uh, soccer playing daughter in the audience. Because <laughs> uh, that expression of shooting at the keeper is, is um, familiar because it's sort of a truism of playing soccer too. <laughs> it's like, that's un the unfortunate focus some of the time. Yearning. I do not want to be remembered for my urine. In this, I differ from the chow chow and Welsh corgi who yearn to soak the earth, to imbue the foggy air with their unique pea scents, who knows through the streets in search of smells of dogs gone by and recorded for canine history until rain rinses hydrant and trunk. If only I could so shed skin or salt tear as I tread my neighborhood, and thus plant in friends' hearts, my deeds, my ways, my thinking, my art, civil equivalent of dog's liquid legacy. This is about imagined artwork. Unbound. Everyone knows the artist of this painting has been dead for centuries. The cataloger knows because she tracked the oil's provenance from its day of origin through each of its owners to its current spot on the museum wall. The curator knows because she has studied this artist for years and sees everything about him this oil reveals from its browns and ochres telling his home to its old chiaroscuro tracing his training. The chemist knows because he has probed the age of the dye stuffs and varnishes. The visitor knows because she has traipsed through hall after hall through ancient times to the middle ages to this oil while she knows the artist is dead, here she stands in conversation with him. His wit cracks her up. Her laughter startles the guard who is unused to others like himself. Before opening and after closing, he also chuckles with the dead artist, banter unbound by mortality or clocks. This poem, while it's about imaginary art, is not about an imaginary artist. Um, Kelly Russell Agdon, who Sandy mentioned earlier, is um, a, a common um, source of, of uh, joy and poetry pleasure for both of us. Um, talks about writing into your passions. <laughs> she very politely calls them that rather than obsessions, but. I have an obsession with um, Paula Motorson Becker, and, and, and this poem came out of that obsession. Pregnant. This painting gives birth to baby paintings, not pretend or metaphoric births, litters of miniatures, which tumble from the untidy backside of the canvas where the artist stapled the edges of cloth to wood. Trained on the gravid frame, cameras splutter to uselessness, recording nothing of the repeating miracle. After each phone call from the night guards, the museum director purrs to opera on her car radio during her inbound commute. Ah, uh, the institution's income is secure. At auction at Sotheby's, the miniatures will be gobbled up. The subject of the painting, no surprise, is the smiling nude self-portrait of none other than Paula Motorson Becker, pregnant. 
For decades, art historians believed the opus among those destroyed by Nazis. In neglected museum storage, a persistent cataloger sorting through a clutch of small unsigned pieces had discovered hovering above them in the shadows, the object of fecundity. The complete simplicity, the simple completeness said it was Paula's, her PM hyphen B in the corner surplus. The young cataloger performed her job, documented the crowd of little portrait portraits of infants. Only when Paula's pregnant nude graced the gallery wall and the next births occurred, did the cataloger attribute the nursery of tiny pictures to the workshop of Paula Motorson Becker. Had all these ideas come to Paula before the fatal embolism, which killed her days after her only daughter was born? In her notoriety, the cataloger graduates to curator and the infant miniatures spread Paula's legacy around the globe, each child presenting her own humor, her own hues, yet so like her mother. Thank you. Uh, this next poem is an erasure um, from How to Keep Bees by Anna Botsford Comstock. Recourse. Where to put sunshine in the afternoon? An ideal place on sod ground where trees are a joy. What then? Young horses will be permitted. Then a trellis of grapes, hops, Virginia creeper, lilac trees. Shade must have recourse, perhaps with a simple slanting ample enough to allow an aisle between stones and air, between high winds, this row of hardy evergreens. Which is a secret tribute, grass, salt, or ashes, this period spent on our knees? When would numbness reach the doorway? When is safe? Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. You, the, the new book is held together with tape and glue. Pamela Hobart Carter. And I, as I said, I just always uh, revel when uh, we can bring the sisterhood together here on Cultivating Voices. And it's been just amazing to hear about all your other endeavors around how you use the collage. I love that you showed us that as well. It's really great to uh, be able to have a window into people's process. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us today. Beautiful. Well, my friends, it's we move to our final reader for our final new books showcase of 2021. And we were very fortunate last week to get a, 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 a preview of uh, Marsha Karp's poetry during our poet's focus on clocks, our themed live open mic. And I'm, I'm so grateful to those of you who were with us and who listened to um, that. And it was a really terrific reading. And Marsha came and read one of her poems. And so it's just terrific to be able to hear you two weeks in a row, Marsha. Let me tell you a little bit more about Marsha Karp. Marsha Karp's new collection, If By Song, was published this year by Lily Poetry Review Books. And if you're not familiar with the books that are put out by, um, published by um, Lily Poetry Review Books, 
and or the Lily Poetry Review. I really can't, uh, I can't express enough how much um, I really love what Eileen Cleary is doing. They had a reading just, uh, just an hour ago to launch uh, some new titles. And uh, if I wasn't prepping for here, I would have been going to that launch because I really, really do love what um, Eileen Cleary curates. Marsha Karp's collection, If by Song, as I mentioned, is titled from that press. Marsha has had poems and translations in the Times Literary Supplement, the Harvard Review, the Guardian, and, um, and also Catalyst in English and Petrarch in English from Penguin Books, the word exchange from Norton, and joining music with reason, 34 poets from Oxford, 20, Oxford 2004, 2009 from Wayweiser are her other collections. I am just so very pleased to be able to welcome Marsha Karp to the program for, to be able to share her newest work, but also to uh, celebrate with you um, the way that she has engaged in uh, translation and study and poetry throughout her wonderful career. Thanks for being with us, Marsha. Thank you so much, Sandy and Don and Kim for um, making this possible. And I wanna say something to Sudeep, Kathleen and Pamela, how moved I am by the particularities in, in all of your poems. Thank you. I guess I should say I'm gonna be reading two poems. Missing brother, missing son. When we agreed you were gone, we spoke your name loudly and often shouted it out to anyone who had known you or met you. Lost in the crowd, we'd find reasons to spit it out into the eyes of just anyone. Once again, Cain. Cain again fingered his face for his fault, his protection, the taint of his trespass and blessing, for nobody marked him, nobody knew who he was. He'd thought they would, he wished they would, bereft and alone, unrelated. His father had favored his brother, the fat and the first of the flock put to shame tendered fruit. But he'd been the firstling his father had fathered. He'd grown to love gardens because of his parents, luxurious stories of love, fruit, and labors of love were his fables. He'd learned all their lessons and those the wind whispered to warn him, the least son, he thought, of something desired once did. His gift was good. His father couldn't speak ill of it. If Abel had not fed his flock, the fruit disparaged, despised, despoiled, since father shunned, Cain wouldn't have wished him dead, wouldn't have wondered if wishes could kill when at once Abel died. His parents didn't blame him or know that spilt blood found its tongue in foul accusation crying, Cain. Someone cried murderer, breaking our mourning. Our service was private. One son and two parents who thought they were the world, who dare disturb first grief. Cain went east to a sleepy little land of brothers and mothers and fathers and son, known now to each other as butchers and bakers and thieves. Cain called himself a student and studied well their manner. He tried his hand at baking. He tried his hand at thieving. He tried to live as if he were a man like any man. He studied well the way love was. He thought he wanted love. 
He thought he was a kind man. What seemed like love was loneliness cut back, which flourished when she left him, which blossomed when he left her. His gifts were not for love. He grew alone. He grew alone. When someone called him Cain, he heard and Abel echo. Their parents had called them Cain and Abel, come quickly. Abel and Cain, come look at the stars. They'd bounded together towards awe. When he visited his parents, their only son now, first and last and least, no more. If ever outside himself he had been, he always spoke of Abel and Eve and Adam were grateful to hear their lost son's name. Eve was immobile, movement was measured, some shadow embodied stayed her steps in impulse. Impossible inches impeded her wanderings. Still, whither she went, again Adam went with her. Walking the garden was work never finished. They'd only one fruit tree, one flower bed now, one rusty patch for the fruits of the earth. Cain was their prize crop now, cared for though absent. They asked me for nothing, and that's what I answered with. Then I heard Cain on the wind, west to my father I came. Something had happened and Adam was wholly at war against himself and not trusting himself, he scrutinized Cain. Cain's was the last love Adam would ask for, for Eve was unable to love now, and Adam knew no one save Cain. Not needing sleep to dream, Eve awoke to find no one and nothing she knew. Not Eden, not Adam, not even the fruit on their tree could she name. She called Adam torment. Cain fought with his father and knew that his father cried out in secret. Cain had his own fears. He was all Adam, all Eve. All that he was was born in the garden. Cain, who lived far from the world of the world, who'd watched when he'd watched it, encaved in the shadow of Cain, now went to the world with his family. But first he told Adam, their flower was frailer than may snow astonished furled seedlings. And Adam, in first grief, let Cain call the world to pluck Eve from their, his side. And Eve being told gathered strength and opposed him, faultier than a serpent's truth. My child is your calling. No, 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 no. They waited, the world came to gather, transplant, prop and sustain her far from their garden. And Cain found him who'd wandered from breath. Cain hurled a rock against a rock to smash the air, my father. Cain didn't wonder if wishes could kill anymore. Abel had died on his own. Still, something stayed Cain from the life he would live, some sentence imposed long ago. In his wanted cell, Cain knew his crime was made fresh by the death of his father. The rigors of his death condemned the vigor of his son to spend itself amazed and fruitless. Cain held his parent fast and faultless. Distant kindred cursed Cain's grief. Then Cain must tell Eve as she lay among strangers, mother, he's dead. By his hand, yes. And mother, yes, mother me now. So Eve knew but couldn't say how. The body of Adam was buried in bellies of beasts denied Eden, its flesh and its bowels, 
Its eyes were decayed in the maws of the beasts Adam, Cain, Abel had named. And sometimes straight on the wind came his father to Cain, his scent or his whisper, his laugh sigh or air of him. The father of old Cain had loved when a young man, the first of men in his world. Not kindness nor kin to Eve now was Cain. Go, I could kill you. Eve now in her turn sought his harm. Help me, I'll bite you, help me. And his weeping for Abel, his weeping for Adam, were titters in paradise next to this weeping, it seemed to him now. Eve began her song. And Cain sang in return, so he might not remember his silence towards Adam. Can you lift me up, my dear son? Oh, no, dear mother, why? To carry me round so the people can see. It would make the people cry. Like a child in my arms, sweet mother, I'd bring you round the town. And old friends then could look again for what they knew when you were you. Can you go to hell, my dear son? It won't take long to go. Eve might call for Adam or Abel. She called most for Cain, her companion, her keeper, who kept her pieces close together. He'd say, if I'd only, oh, mother, believe me. Cain went out when she cried. Comfort me, Cain. Once long ago, Eve told him the story of Cain. The child you were, Cain, convicted himself of being a child, a person, alive. We meant to acquit you of cumbrous charges that grew as you grew. But we saw our slip of a boy propagate opposition to himself. As Eve was speaking, what came back to Cain was his infant guilt, cunning and craven. His crimes were exempted by pitying parents from penalty. Or some doubt he'd discharge his debt if his payments were few and small, kept him on trial for his faults, for his trials, for his doubt from the first judgment due and forever it seemed. A woman taunted Eve, ableless, Adamless, less than Eve, Eve. Cain in a lie said the taunts were for him. Even then she knew and said no. Then they called Cain one day. Eve was destroyed in a fall, pushed by a taunter in full knowledge of harm. Cain had to remind himself, fresh in the loss of Adam, that his loss was not the sum of Eve's life. She called and called for a girl she'd been a girl with, or Adam. When Eve told Cain she had spoken with Adam, Cain was resigned. Tell my father, dear mother, I miss him. When Eve would raise her hand to herself, Cain was unkind. He went to the strangers who tended to Eve and asked them to care, for he thought her unfair, though Eve was diminished and he hated her then. Again and again, Cain scratched for its roots, yet he could not follow his mark. Its tangle of runners defeated him. He always meant not to, but often did. Discount not his weight, but the weight the world held him in. Like that time his father, he'd thought, had favored his brother. He kept Eve alive because he was lonely. They called Cain too late, and he came to Eve, now empty of air save the fetid wind trapped, sickening her son, when all that Eve was but flesh went. 
pain couldn't conceive again ever containing the wash and the whip he'd once held to be life, held with pure having, not naming the hold on him. He felt now not nothing, but seldom remembering some pleasure, some grief, some puzzle of pride. He who'd brought Adam and Eve, who'd brought Abel, a delicate language they'd learned, for they loved him, lived level and lone now. Fate again figured Cain's face that no one might know Cain, save Cain. Thank you. What? Thank you. Thank you so much, Marsha Carp. What, what a, what a depth to bring to that story that we that we think we know, but to have it told, you know, th through the particular prism of your understanding. What a, what a, what a. What a what a what a true remarkable uh, way for us to end our program today, and I'm very very grateful that we were able to hear from Marsha Carp, and the collection is if by song. Mm, so moved, so really struck by it. All right, everyone. We have been together today for our final new books showcase of 2021. I continue to emphasize that because I'm eager uh, for what will await us in 2022. We've had such a journey together through since March, 2020, been able to showcase so many new books and hear from hundreds of poets also during our live open mic and our first full year of Sundays, 50 Sundays to be precise, because we, we take a couple weeks off at the end of the year, at the end and beginning of the year. We'll begin again in January, but not before we gather one final time in 2021. Next Sunday, it's our holiday poetry open house where we'll come together to celebrate the work that we've shared together. Uh, I, it is, uh, I will have a few special guests to um, share poetry with us and a number of you will get chosen out of Kim Ports Parsons, as she said, Santa's cap to read in our live holiday open mic. I hope that you will come back and bring your spirits of the season with you so that we can gather in this season of peace and light and celebrate poetry together one last time on Cultivating Voices live poetry for, next, for the year. I want to, uh, before I just make a couple other announcements, how about we unmute and thank all our readers today. Sudeep Sen joining us from New Delhi, Kathleen Flanagan and Pamela Hobart Carter. And we closed with Marsha Karp. Thank you all so, so very much. Huzzah! Huzzah! love. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, a reminder that if you have a new book coming out in 2022, please feel free to get in contact with me. Um, we'll be putting uh, putting this. I'm gonna I'm gonna fill up the schedule as quickly as I can for the 2022 season, and 
Join us in our new book showcase on the second and fourth Sundays of the month. Mark it on your calendars. We'll be here and as well as our open mics. Well, my friends, as I always say at the end of the program, our humanity truly does depend on our deepest of listening to one another. Uh, you demonstrate the display of that humanity every single week when, when you join us here in Zoom, when you watch on Facebook or watch live and or watch the recordings later that we have on YouTube as well as on Facebook. Thanks to Don Krieger for providing that opportunity for us to be able to do that. And of course, thanks to Kim Ports Parsons for all of your promotion of poets, the love of poetry, and making sure that we know how to purchase the books of the folks that join us here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I'm Sandy Yunone, I'm your host. I look forward to being back with you next Sunday for our final reading. Please do come back to celebrate with me and all your friends that have been part of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry here in our Zoom Poetry Studio. We'll have a great 90 minutes of poetry together to um, celebrate the season and uh, you know maybe bring a little, little Mary with you. So have a great week and be well. Keep writing my friends and stay safe. We'll see you next week. And I'm just gonna give some shout outs to everybody as we leave the room for today. Those of you that I'm seeing. Thanks so much, Yeva, Scott. Pamela, of course, Billy Brown, Marsha Carp, thank you once again. Martina, thank you. Jude, so nice to have you here with us today. Mary Gilliland, it's so great to see you today. Kate Wegerson, we'll see, I know I'm going to see you next week. Isaac Cohen joining us from Israel. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeva, great to see you. Mary Miriam, beautiful to have you with us here today. Sudeep, of course, thank you so, so much. Mary Ellen Talley, who was our, in our first new book showcase of the year in 2021. I hope I'll see you next weekend. Kim, Lenora Good, great to see you with us here today. Indran, hello. Patricia, great to have you here. Brownstone is the poetry series. Vanessa Smith, thank you so much for being with us today. So thank you so much. Our good friend, I love. I, I always love your nickname, Doll Mathis. I love it. It's great to have you with Risa. I'm so happy to see you today. Oh my gosh, I hope you'll come back next weekend. I hope everyone will be here. Rosaline, Charlene Neely, Leslie Trainer, Amit. Dahyabacha with your new book also out. And of course, I think my final is Don Krieger for today to send my greetings to. I'll see you all next week for our holiday poetry open house. It's been so great to be with you today, my friends. Uh, just keep doing what you're doing out there. You're remarkable. And I'm so grateful to all of you.